Okay, I'd, I'd like to welcome everyone to the next um, webinar in PPMD series. I'm John Porter. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. And today I'm sitting here with Dr. Michael Binks, who will talk about Pfizer's anti-myostatin antibody program for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'll let Michael introduce himself, but, but I just note that, that we'll, we will be, be dealing with the questions that have been submitted in advance. Um, they'll either be answered during the talk itself, or, or I'll bring them up at the end of the talk. And I just note that, that you have the capability to submit questions online at any time, and, and we'll just make note of those. And, and we might deal with some of them during the course of the webinar, or we'll certainly come back to things at the end. So, Michael, if you'd like to start. Yes, yeah, thanks, John. First of all, uh, welcome to our uh, research facility in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's uh, great to have you here. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I'll just give you a, a little bit of background about myself. I'm a, a, originally a Scot. I grew up, was born, born and grew up in Scotland, uh, studied in London, uh, studied medicine and immunopharmacology, trained ultimately as a rheumatologist and was in clinical practice for uh, 15 years or so and then uh, moved into the pharmaceutical industry. And, and I think the rest uh, of my history you could find on LinkedIn if you want to uh, uh, search on it. But I've always been involved in uh, translational medicine and, and translational research and early drug development. I joined Pfizer about a year ago and joined a fantastic team of people uh, here. Uh, and they're, uh, some of whom are uh, with me in the room, I'd like to uh, um, mentioned Carl Morris, who is the lead biologist on the program and has been uh, uh, driving this uh, project forward for the last four or five years. Uh, and also uh, Shannon Marafino, who is the, the clinician uh, scientist on, on the project uh, and has uh, been very closely involved in, in the development of uh, all the clinical protocols that have got us to this, uh, this point. We also have in the room uh, Catherine Beaverson, who is uh, our uh, uh, patient uh, uh, advocate uh, representative uh, within uh, the Pfizer Rare Disease Research Unit. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Catherine with us uh, uh, in the team. Okay, so what I wanted to do uh, this morning was to run through some of the background uh, uh, biology of uh, our target, which is uh, myostatin, um, to talk about uh, uh, various ways of uh, interacting, inter interfering with that target, uh, and uh, exploring uh, some of the preliminary data that we have, well, some of the data that we have in early stage uh, studies uh, with our uh, antibody. First of all, uh, before I say anything else, I have to uh, dis uh, show this disclaimer for Safe Harbor. Um, <clears throat> so I'll be walking through uh, the, the potential for myostatin inhibitors in Duchenne, um, and uh, the, some of the detail around our particular uh, monoclonal antibody against myostatin, which has the really sexy name of PF0652616. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a better name yet, but it'll it'll come. It just rolls come. right off the tongue, right? Yeah, it does. You know, <laughs> if you if you knew the process to get a drug name, um, it's long and arduous. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure we'll have one before too long. So the target uh, that we're interested in is myostatin. It's also called GDF8. Um, and it was really identified way back in, in the late 90s uh, when the observation was made that uh, uh, in animals that had no myostatin uh, in their system, in their body, uh, through a genetic mutation, that they had uh, increase in muscle mass, an increase in strength compared with uh, th this uh, mouse here um, on, the, on the left, which has a normal uh, degree of muscle mass. Now, that, so that was an interesting uh, observation um, and led to a lot of exploration about uh, the, what this particular gene and this uh, protein, which turns out to be a small sort of protein hormone that circulates in the bloodstream. Um, uh, 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 the many years of research have, have uh, uh, 
identified uh, much more about the biology uh, of this uh, molecule. But also just looking at other um, species, we've found mm. that in sheep and in dogs and in cattle and in fish and also in humans, uh, this gene, uh, when it is uh, removed through mutation and the protein myostatin is not in the system, that the animals all get a, a, a common appearance of an increase in muscle mass and you can measure increase in muscle strength and performance. So that tends to tell you that biologically speaking, this is a really important protein. The other thing to say about uh, these, uh, these sorts of observations was that these animals have a normal lifespan and other than this finding on uh, muscle mass, uh, seem to be perfectly well. So it does suggest that uh, the, this uh, protein hormone, myostatin, has an effect to uh, inhibit the growth of muscle, and, um, and that is preserved across uh, multiple uh, species. Okay, so uh, the hormone itself is a, it's a small uh, hormone. It's produced by uh, muscle cells, it's secreted, released from muscle cells uh, into the circulation, uh, and you can measure uh, the, the hormone in the blood. In the circulation, it's protected by a, a, a little peptide that uh, protects it from uh, interaction that can be removed uh, through, uh, through various uh, means. Uh, but when it's removed, the hormone itself is in its active state and can bind to a receptor that's expressed largely on muscle cells called the active in R2B receptor. And you can see it there in the, in the bottom right. Now, it's worth saying a few things about this. So the interaction of myostatin with the receptor is like a lock and key. It's, it's specific, and when the interaction happens, the receptor... Uh, goes into action and, and triggers some downstream signaling, we, we call it. So various processes within the cell uh, that have consequences um, uh, in, in how the cell works. So it's a, a specific interaction, lock and key interaction, but, uh, and, and the, the, the key is, is uh, myostatin, but the lock actually can be uh, unlocked or activated by various keys. Um, and in fact, there are six or seven other protein hormones or growth factors that interact with this receptor uh, in, in uh, a similar way to myostatin, but having slightly different effects. Uh, I, I, I emphasize that because one of the uh, questions we uh, have had has been about um, some studies performed with um, uh, drugs that, that are based on the structure of the receptor and that have uh, that ability to bind a wider variety of, of uh, growth factors and hormones than just myostatin. And we've seen uh, this issue arise both in animal model, uh, uh, animal model studies and in the clinic. Uh, but it's, it's an important thing to, to establish that there's the, the activity of myostatin itself and there's the activity of the receptor uh, and there's the binding affinity of myostatin itself and there's the binding of the receptor and they're not uh, interchangeable. Okay, um, so the next thing to uh, talk about then is, is just at the levels uh, of cellular uh, function that uh, myostatin um, intervenes. And it seems to be in two places. Firstly, in, the, in inhibiting the number of muscle cells that, that are uh, developed, but also in the maturation of those muscle cells. Um, and uh, it, it, so it occurs at two important control points in the development of a, a, a muscle. A muscle um, I've gone too far. Okay. Um, so the biology is clearly important. 
uh, we understand uh, something a, a about how it acts at a molecular level and at a cellular level. And very early on, uh, uh, not long after the identification of those uh, uh, m uh, mice with uh, increased musculature, people started asking, how could this be uh, um, a, a used to, to help in, in muscle disease in particular? And one of the obvious settings to, uh, uh, to ask that question is in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so the, uh, a lot of work was done uh, uh, around uh, the millennium uh, to, to, to answer that question. So I, the, the first study I'd like to highlight here um, uh, just shows the, the uh, m muscle uh, quality in the MDX mouse, um, which is a, one of the... Uh, uh, mouse models that are thought to resemble uh, Duchenne muscle. And you can see quite a disordered muscle pattern of muscle. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, white material that is uh, collagen uh, and uh, the fibrotic replacement, we'd call it. There's some evidence of inflammation up here. Uh, the muscle fibers themselves are, are very irregular, some with uh, abnormal nuclei. And in this panel down here, this is also the NDX. Uh, animal. This has been stained with a, 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 sta a blue stain for collagen, and you can see the almost honeycomb pattern here of uh, collagen uh, fibers within the muscle. And that's uh, a very abnormal, and it's, uh, it is the, the kind of change that's seen in a Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, um, when we grow up, I'm dropping arrows all over the place here, I'm not quite sure why. Yeah. Um, well, never mind. Um, over, uh, over here, uh, this is a piece of muscle from uh, an animal, animal that uh, has the MDX uh, um, uh, uh, def uh, defect, uh, but also uh, was grown in, in, the, in the absence of myostatin. And although this muscle is not normal, there's no question, it's not normal, um, there's very much less uh, fibrotic tissue. Uh, there's, there's, there, there aren't any of these uh, uh, white areas where, where uh, globules are, that are actually uh, fat cells. Um, and there's uh, much less evidence of uh, inflammation. But the most striking finding is beyond fibrosis. And you can see in, the, in, in this panel here, the uh, amount of blue material is much reduced relative to the uh, MDX. So that was very encouraging, but of course, if you're dealing with a genetic change in the germline of the animal, you don't know whether the, the effect is occurring during neonatal development or very early development, uh, and it certainly doesn't answer the question of whether <clears throat> uh, interfering with, with that, uh, uh, with that uh, target uh, in a m m more mature setting is going to have the same effect. And so <clears throat> um, it was important to look with, in more mature uh, animals, uh, intervening by um, uh, blocking myostatin with an antibody uh, to see whether there was a similar benefit in, in the muscle quality. Uh, and I think um, it, it, it's possible to see between, uh, I'll get the arrow again, so this again is the uh, MDX um, sample, uh, and, and down here is the, the MDX uh, animal, an example of uh, muscle from the animal, uh, which has been treated with a myostatin um, and, and again, you can see very much less of the white material, uh, none of these uh, fat areas, um, and uh, probably a, a, an improvement in the in the morphology, the shape of uh, the muscle fibers themselves. So these types of experiments gave people uh, uh, a lot of confidence to um, to think about uh, whether inhibiting myostatin would be uh, a, a therapeutic target in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and. Um, uh, and there was a, a number of efforts, I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, to, to test that uh, hypothesis. 
So, yeah. Michael, just just a, a general learning point here. How how important is is it to a company like Pfizer to have a thorough understanding of the mechanism of action of of your drug? Say in this particular case, I mean, you can talk about this particular case, but the general point about you know how important it is as far as you making a decision about going forward with a program. Well, I think it's it's very important to understand the mechanism in, in that uh, you have confidence in the, in the biology and what you're um, uh, what you're able to test. If you don't really understand the mechanism, you can't be, know what what to measure uh, downstream. Um, uh, and so it, it, it gives us a lot more uh, confidence if we understand the molecular mechanism. It's not that it's impossible to progress something where you don't understand the mechanism. I don't know what, Carl, you're our uh, biologist. Did you want to say anything about that? I mean, is that reflect your experience? Yeah, I, I think we, we, we really need to understand the confidence in, uh, around the mechanism of action. And particularly with muscle, there, there's um, um, some questions popping up about other indications as well. And anything where there's sort of a frailty, a situation where there's less uh, um, muscle bulk and, and function, we, this type of approach is, has value. Um, we really want to sort of learn as much as we can about the safety um, of this mechanism to ensure that um, other organs like the heart or, um, would, not, would not actually be impacted with inhibition. So I mean, the, the answer is yeah, it's not a sine qua non. That is, you know, we can progress without an understanding of mechanism, but the more we understand, the better we're able to construct, uh, uh, um, uh, understand the relationships between the, the drug concentration and the effect. Good, thanks. Okay. Um, so, so that gave the field, I think, a mm good... -hmm. Uh, feeling that there, there may be some value in inhibiting myostatin in Duchenne patients. And in, in fact, two clinical studies, uh, in, in muscular dystrophy at least, have already been completed. So the first was uh, performed by uh, Wyeth Pharmaceuticals, uh, and this was a, a monoclonal antibody to uh, myostatin. Um, uh, in fact, it wasn't tested in Duchenne itself. Uh, in that disease, but but in in some Becker's patients uh, and uh, uh, FSH and limb girdle muscular dystrophy, um, and unfortunately, uh, as the doses were uh, increased, uh, it was became clear that the anti that the drug caused uh, rashes, uh, and it was felt really that we couldn't get up to the doses that were required to inhibit the mechanism. Um, uh, without without causing uh, in, in, uh, intoler you know without without causing uh, uh, tolerability problems with this uh, rash. It wasn't a dangerous thing, but it, it it's felt overall it wasn't possible to continue the development. Uh, so so that was uh, one one thing we we came away from that experiment understanding that we needed to get um, more potent and probably more active molecules that could uh, deliver uh, the the effects we want to see, but without some of uh, some other side effects. Now you see that kind of side effect with all sorts of biologics, uh, that is big proteins that are delivered as as drugs. It's not that unusual. It's uh, often not very predictable from a, a mechanistic point of view. Um, but uh, clearly, the lower doses you can give, uh, the less likely you are to have that, that kind of effect if you don't understand the mechanism. So, so Michael, there was a question in advance about the, the fact that, that Bristol-Myers Squibb has an ongoing program that targets myostatin, mm -hmm. and you've just pointed out two studies that previously did that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think you just you just gave very nice justification mm -hmm. for, for why the field, and, and what, certainly why PTMD is interested in having multiple shots on goal mm -hmm. in, in, in trying to test particular mechanisms, because the, the purpose of the clinical trial, of course, is to see whether something works, with, has high efficacy and low, low safety issues. Right. And, and, it, I mean, and it tells a story about drug discovery and drug development, just how difficult it, you know, the genes identified in 1997 or is published in 1997, um, and uh, over the subsequent decades, 
uh, we've got some drugs, we've gone into the clinic, they've failed for one reason or another, I'll come to the second one in a moment, and uh, you know, it's required a lot of persistence from various scientists to say, no, this is, this is a really important mechanism, we have to pursue it and find, uh, find the drug that is going to be safe and tolerable and deliver the effects that we want. So I, I, but it's an important learning that drug discovery takes a long time, and often there are, there are obstacles. And it, and it gets back to your point about confidence in the, the mechanism. If, if uh, the biology didn't look as good as it did in the animals, it's unlikely that companies would have gone back into this, uh, given some of the failures. Okay. So the second trial was um, one of those with a, a drug that was based on the receptor. And so it had a, a wider, um, it bound to a wider range of these growth factors of protein. Um, and, and in fact, one of the, the reason the development was stopped, we believe, uh, was uh, that the drug caused nosebleeds and a particular kind of uh, vascular skin rash um, that we can assign to one of these particular, um, we'll say, off-target uh, activities, uh, but actually was, is one of the protein hormones that the receptor normally binds to. So, so we came out of that experiment uh, understanding that we needed a more selective approach uh, than uh, the receptor, uh, uh, just the receptor um, fusion protein uh, approach. So uh, we needed a, a narrower range of binding affinities. Um, so, oops, how do I move forward? Here we go. So uh, Carl and his team went looking for uh, a new monoclonal antibody uh, uh, that was better than the wire that one from the point of view of being uh, more potent. That is, it has a greater effect with a less drug. Um, <clears throat> uh, and a greater effect overall uh, than, than the wire antibody. But also a drug that was more selective than, than the other uh, type of uh, drug that had failed uh, the, the, in the... the um, second of those previous clinical studies that I mentioned. Um, and uh, the, the antibody that's been selected is the one with the sexy name, 616 we'll call it for now. Um, and it binds not only to uh, uh, myostatin in its uh, native state, but also when it's partly complexed with the peptides that protect it in the circulation. And that's the antibody that we've taken through uh, uh, preclinical animal studies in, in uh, two species, and we've uh, looked at the uh, safety and toxicology studies, and that we've now uh, taken through phase one and uh, into a phase two setting. I keep pressing the, the wrong key. Um, so, first of all, we looked at the, the effects of this, this antibody in normal mice, and we were able to show that um, relative to the myo 29 the previous antibody uh, been in the clinic, that um, the, if anything, the, the effects on muscle growth uh, of inhibiting myostat in this way uh, were similar or greater. And uh, the effects on the function of the muscle, particularly uh, as measured by um, the force generated by uh, tetanic contraction, um, was very much greater than, than the um, myo 29 antibody. In, in most of the respects that we've compared, this seems to be a better, uh, stronger antibody. When we looked in uh, mice who carry the MDX uh, uh, genotype, um, uh, we also saw an increase in muscle, uh, um, muscle mass. Uh, and the increase in muscle mass, interestingly, was of a similar uh, size to the, the change, was of a sim similar size to normal, to the change that we saw in normal animals. So even though the muscle is abnormal, the increase in muscle mass was of a similar uh, size. And I think that, that's important because that's another doubt that we've uh, had. You know, w would you get the same kind of benefit if the muscle was abnormal uh, because of its strophin defect? 
Uh, and then we looked, uh, not in mice, but in, in monkeys this time, in cyanomologous monkeys, and uh, we were able to show a very clear dose response, which means uh, we could understand the relationship between the amount of drug we give and the effect it has um, or, or by measuring muscle mass using a, a DEXA scanning uh, system. And interestingly, again, compared with an equivalent uh, uh, amount of antibody of myo 29 we saw about twice the effect on muscle mass. Okay. Uh, we also studied the duration of uh, effect. So, so we dosed here uh, in this panel for uh, seven or eight uh, weeks. Uh, and you can see there was a fairly rapid onset of effect. But after we stopped dosing, that effect was maintained for a good few weeks after uh, uh, the dosing was stopped. As well as uh, measuring uh, by a DEXA scanning, we also looked by MRI and CT. Here I've shown uh, the monkey uh, MRI scan and the increase in muscle uh, uh, volume as measured by the MRI, uh, again showing an increase as you increase the dose of the drug. So we felt uh, then th there was enough in this uh, pharmacology package to uh, not only uh, progress into man, but to continue with some of the uh, imaging monitoring uh, in our clinical studies as we've done in, in the preclinical ones. We also uh, had at that time uh, a toxicology program that gave us a lot of confidence to um, move forward uh, into, into adults in the first place um, and uh, in, in, into children uh, thereafter. This, this may be a good time to ask this, this one question. So as the audience well knows, that there's rather substantial cardiac effects with, with the shin. And, and have you looked at, with your preclinical program, did you look at any efficacy or safety measures for, for heart? Okay. Well, they're, they're always uh, part of a, a, a toxicology safety program. I think the, the most convincing fact that I can, I can say is that uh, in our longer-term preclinical toxicology in juvenile animals, so the, the, these are, uh, I can't remember the ages exactly, but they're both in rats and in monkeys. Uh, we studied uh, the, the histology and, and the, the morphology in the heart after six months of dosing, and at heroic doses. So we're talking... Um, almost 300 milligrams per kilogram in a monkey and uh, almost 500 milligrams per kilogram in a rat. So absolutely heroic uh, dosing. And the uh, histology in the heart was completely normal. The heart weights were normal. Um, so we've got no reason from a healthy juvenile animal to think that there should be a problem in the heart. Um, so, uh, and I, I think that that gives us some degree of confidence. Not the same as saying in a Duchenne affected heart there could be no uh, uh, no effect. I mean, we we can't say that without doing the experiment. Essentially, um, we didn't uh, observe any cardiac uh, defects in the MDX studies, but. But you know it's less well uh, qualified and, and you know, less well less formally studied. It's not done. Um, done but I think the, the, the fact that six months of dosing at, at very high doses in in uh, juvenile animals in two species, we didn't see any heart effects, gives us the confidence to say, well, you know, we can't say never. You know, you're going to never say never. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're, how we're uh, monitoring, uh, planning to monitor in the phase two study. Good, thanks. Okay, um, so our phase one study uh, looked at, a, this is in healthy adult humans, um, about eight uh, per, uh, per group. We looked at a, a dose range of between one and 40 milligrams per kilogram um, uh, in a single dose. 
and uh, over uh, three doses at 10 milligrams per kilogram in a, in a repeat dose uh, fashion over a period of a month. Um, and we measured, obviously, the drug concentration, but also the myostatin concentration. We measured uh, lean body mass by DEXA, and we measured uh, some exploratory uh, uh, DEXA and MRI uh, imaging biomarkers. Um, so this is primarily a safety uh, study. Um, and from, I'll, I'll just show you a, a, some of the data. So this, uh, uh, this is the drug concentration over here on the left. And this, uh, the drug basically behaved as we would expect a monoclonal antibody to do. Um, the concentrations increased with dose, the half-life, that is the, 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 the time it takes for the drug to drop by 50% uh, uh, in concentration in the blood was a, around two weeks. So very much like every other, uh, not every other, but m m many uh, uh, IgG antibodies in the clinic. And on the right here, uh, we, we show uh, the concentration of, uh, of myostatin itself. Now, this is slightly complicated by the fact that when uh, the antibody binds to myostatin, myostatin normally is removed from the system very quickly. Uh, when it binds to the antibody, it actually increases in concentration in the circulation. It can't bind anything because it's bound to the antibody. It can't interact with the receptor. But uh, the, the, what we measure is the, the increase in the level of uh, GDF8 in the circulation as the dose increases. And this gives us some confidence that we are actually engaging myostatin and, and that the, the, well, we talk about target engagement and it's a, a useful measure for us just to give confidence in the, in the relationships. So our first sort of uh, pharmacologic uh, measure was to look at uh, lean body mass uh, after 28 days of a single dose of drug. Uh, and, you know, I think we were probably a little bit ambitious here to expect to, to see a signal so early. Uh, but we certainly can't convince ourselves that there's a statistically significant uh, signal here. Maybe there's a trend in the data. That's the best that we could ever say. Um, uh, so that doesn't give us as warm a feeling as we'd, uh, we'd like. However, when we looked at uh, the, the MRI signals, and you know, you'll know you be aware that there's a lot of emerging data around uh, the value of MRI uh, in, the, in the assessment of uh, muscle in Duchenne. Uh, this, so this is a c calculation based on the percentage of, uh, of muscle uh, um, in, in, the, in the thigh. And uh, Using this type of measure, we were able to see a very clearly statistically significant effect, both at four weeks and out of four months. And, and that actually gave us some uh, more confidence that we were at least in the right pharmacologic range to start to be able to see a beneficial effect on muscle. Okay. So our conclusions at the end of that study, well, we've demonstrated safety and tolerability as far as it goes. This is in adults. This is single dose up to 40 milligrams. This is a repeat dose over a month. So, you know, it's a step forward. Uh, in conjunction with the preclinical safety, uh, we had a lot of confidence that we it was reasonable to, to move, move forward. Um, the, the, uh, the drug behaved as we predicted it would behave, uh, and there was some uh, uh, hints that the pharmacology that had been observed preclinically was, was also occurring uh, in, in this uh, clinical setting of very short duration of dosing. And we came to the conclusion that there was really potential here for, for further development. Now, what, what should that next study be? And that exercised us here for some time, uh, trying to uh, understand, uh, you know, is it now the time to go into Duchenne? Should we, uh, should we get some more data in, in human volunteers? Uh, should we do a small study in, in, in uh, Duchenne boys, uh, looking at 
imaging endpoints? Should we do a large study looking at the kind of um, measurements that uh, that might be important if we want to talk to the regulators about getting a drug approved. And in the end, we came to the conclusion that we, we, we shouldn't hold fire, uh, that, that we uh, have, have enough confidence in the uh, safety and in the mechanism uh, to do a study uh, that is perhaps larger than, uh, than, than we might have done in situations that were less urgent. Uh, where the unmet need, if you like, was less uh, less uh, apparent. So, um, so we uh, have built a. Is this on a build or? You know, yeah, looks like it's on. <coughs> okay, so there's no build. So you're seeing everything. All right. Um, so we had designed, in the end, a really quite a complex study um, that we think. Uh, allows us to evaluate the effects of the drug in a, in a formal way that uh, 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 regulators and, and, um, and others will uh, uh, believe is credible, but at the same time is uh, cautious enough uh, that, that we can build confidence in the safety of the molecule over time. Not, not a simple thing to solve, but as well as those things, we were very keen, um, uh, really, through through discussions with uh, PPMD and other groups, to to try and keep focused on on what um, uh, boys and their families are likely to want in the study, and, and the key thing uh, relates to the placebo. So we we really wanted to maintain. Uh, a placebo control in this study uh, so that we could uh, talk about uh, any effect with much more confidence than if we were uh, not comparing with a placebo. And the only way we felt we could uh, do this and still expect people to join the study was to ensure that everybody going into the study gets the active drug at some point. And that's how we, well, we've done it using a, a pseudo crossover design. Well, so essentially uh, each group uh, uh, that's randomized into the study that enrolls in the study um, will be crossed over. So if, if, if they do start off on a placebo, uh, they will, um, uh, after, after 12 months, go on to the active drug. Or so I've jumped ahead a little bit here because uh, uh, this slide normally uh, builds progressively, but but uh, I think it's important to uh, say that we, we, we've um, uh, taken a very cautious approach from safety, but we've uh, also focused on trying to move this forward to a regulatory phase as fast as possible, and we've paid attention to uh, what might be um, a concern of, uh, of boys and, and their families going into a study with a placebo. So along those same lines, um, one question that, that we almost always get with this type of presentation is, is will, there, will there be an extension study? Will there be an expanded access program at the, at the end of your, your, um, right. your, the period you've described here? So, so we are uh, planning an open-label extension study. Um, I think it will be, to some extent, dependent on the results from the study. Um, so if it were clear that by the end of the study this drug isn't, is either not safe or isn't doing what we uh, hoped it would do, um, then, then it's possible that study won't go ahead. Um, but but uh, assuming that, that we have positive results and we're going, uh, moving forward, there will be an open-label study for people to move into. So let me just talk a little bit more about the uh, inclusion criteria for the study. So uh, we're, uh, uh, and this is unpopular, I know, um, uh, we're looking for boys in the age of six to ten years, up to ten years. Um, and, you know, just to say again, the reason that, that uh, many of studies are conducted in, in boys of this age range uh, relates to uh, what, what it's possible to measure and how well those measurements are characterized. Um, so 
uh, we need uh, boys to be able to walk and they need to be on a stable dose of glucocorticoids. I think the period is six months. Um, the drug itself will be a two-hour infusion intravenously. And uh, boys will be randomized to one of three groups. So two of them will be the active drug and one will be a placebo. And they'll receive the drug uh, with monthly checks both blood te tests and clinical checks, um, for four months. At the end of that period, there'll be a review of that individual's safety uh, from the point of view of all the, all the uh, tests that have been conducted and, and, and the investigator's view of how, uh, of any safety uh, issues. If uh, there's a, a, a comfort with the safety and, and, and how the drug is being tolerated, then they will, uh, if they're in the active group, they'll go up to the next dose. Um, and that will, again, be checked after four months. Uh, and, and there'll be another question around, is it safe to escalate the dose? So by the, by the end of the study, we'll have a good idea of uh, which doses are uh, causing some uh, effect and which doses are uh, are uh, causing a, a safety problem if, if either should uh, should occur. So, um, or we may just get to the end of the study knowing that this regime of dose escalating um, uh, has a beneficial effect at the end of uh, one year. So some of the monitoring that we're doing, so we're planning to measure the uh, functional endpoints every two months in the study. Uh, and we're, we've kept our interest in, uh, in DEXA and MRI as measures of uh, muscle uh, volume and quality. Um, and they're being checked every four months also. So it's quite an imaging intensive study. Uh, and you know, some of the feedback we've had is, oh, there's a lot of scans. And there are a lot of scans. But we, we believe that not only can, will we learn about this drug by doing uh, so much um, uh, imaging, uh, but, but we'll be able to generate some information uh, more broadly uh, about uh, how, uh, how the imaging signals change over time. Um, and on the heart, I'll just say before we uh, go on, as we've specifically asked, them, everyone will be getting a baseline echocardiogram or cardiac MRI. We're actually preferring cardiac MRI, but not all the sites are, are comfortable with it. So uh, either are, are, are possible, focusing on the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, which is the, the, the most meaningful measure. And we're measuring that at baseline at 12 months and, and at 24 months. Uh, and uh, I think we're also tracking the ECG, but you know the ECG in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is not very uh, good measure. It tends to be quite noisy and abnormalities, and it's not very clear what we need. We also have a measure, a biochemical measure of cardiac damage, which is the troponin I. So that's being checked. But as I say, you know, it's not because we. We think there's a problem with the drug. It's just that the heart is a, a critically important organ in the general muscular industry, and we certainly don't want to uh, find uh, at some point later that, that there's an adverse effect on the heart. So we're, we're paying very close attention to it. Central on safety issues, we got a question about whether there was any liver signal um, safety issues in your healthy volunteer study. Uh, no, absolutely none. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so uh, where have I got to talking about? Well, let's, so let's just get to the end point. Um, so uh, although many of the development studies and those that are going before the regulators at the moment are focusing on uh, the six-minute walk distance as being uh, the critical end point, we, uh, in our analysis, we, we've, uh, we selected the four-stair climb really for three reasons. So first of all, the effect of this drug, we believe, will be to increase the uh, volume and quality of muscle, particularly in the proximal muscle groups, that is around the hip girdle and the shoulder girdle. Um, and uh, 
we, we were very keen to have a, a fairly direct measure of muscle strength in those uh, those regions. Um, and the four-step climb does a better job of that than the six-minute walk. Secondly, uh, we looked at the variability of the measurement in um, in natural history databases such as uh, the one from Synergy of these two endpoints, and we felt that four step climb was a better tool. Uh, it was less variable. And thirdly, looking back to the 1990s and the steroid studies, actually, you know, the two endpoints that were used that demonstrated the efficacy of steroids in the first place were the 10 minute walk run and the four stair climb. Um, and the signal that they uh, detected uh, in those uh, in those uh, days has now been shown to really have a, had a profound impact on uh, delaying the progression of the disease and prolonging lifespan and all sorts of uh, things that you can make. So it gave us some comfort that this was a, a meaningful um, change. The, the steroid, the, the, the size of the effect that steroids have. There's always going to be a question about, on top of steroids, as in this case, uh, what will our drug do? That's an, a bit of an unknown. But we've been round and round and round this. We saw a lot of difficulty uh, with the six-minute walk distance. We'd have had to, in, in relation to the discussion I had uh, mentioned earlier about how big should this study be, if we wanted to do this study with a six-minute walk, uh, distance and have the same degree of confidence in the result, it would need to be three times the size. Um, okay, so so on the on the, on, the, on that endpoint measure. So this this may be the first time this has been used as a primary endpoint measure in a in a Duchenne muscular dystrophy study. Right. Um, it's been it, used it, as a secondary measure in other studies. Right. 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 Um, so we got a question about what steps, no pun intended, have you taken to to ensure that that the horse is there a crime? Um, that, that, that the, the evaluators are properly trained on, okay. on that measure. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, we've gone to some lengths. Uh, uh, Shannon, would you like to talk sure. about because we can... Yeah, we've been really fortunate to be able to connect with um, physical therapists who have great experience um, in conducting DMD functional testing. Um, through their experience, we've been able to create a manual that we're using um, worldwide for the clinical trial. Um, the, the physical therapists are actually going to each of the sites and conducting hands-on training with those evaluators. Um, in order to qualify the evaluators, they're actually bringing in a child with um, muscular dystrophy to test those assessments to assure that they're able to measure in the same way that the physical therapists are. Um, once they're qualified, they can then um, participate um, in performing those assessments in the clinical trial. Um, during the trial, we'll actually have the physical therapist videotape themselves while they're performing those assessments so that we'll assure over time that those um, uh, methods they're using aren't changing. Um, we appreciate there's a lot of variability in these assessments. Um, but I, it's a critical question. Uh, these are, are difficult things to, to measure, and standardization is, is absolutely critical. As it for forced air climb, as it is for six minute walk. Um, so, so uh, maybe you might want to handle this one right now. Someone's asking about the, about the clinical significance of the four four stair climb. Um, in, in terms of, of registration, you know, the, the idea that, yeah. that you have to present FDA with data that shows that, that, that the drug produces a clinically meaningful benefit to the patient. Right. So, I mean, obviously we have spoken to uh, regulators uh, in, uh, I think, five different countries, uh, and we've discussed this very, very question. Um, we wouldn't be going forward if we didn't think uh, there was uh, a, a reasonable possibility uh, that, that uh, registration would, would happen. Obviously, it depends on how big the effect is, and obviously it depends on whether uh, other things are pointing in the same direction. Uh, and I think that, that's a common theme. All of the regulators want to see uh, more than one endpoint uh, shifting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so uh, you know, we're, as I say, we wouldn't be moving forward with this if we didn't have the confidence that, that uh, regulators would accept 
the forced air climb as much as the six-minute walk, as uh, some of them regard them both as pharmacodynamic endpoints and not clinical endpoints. Um, personally, my argument is, well, actually, being able to climb the stairs is quite an important activity of daily life, and if you can do it, uh, that's a great thing. And if you lose that ability, that's a disaster, and it limits uh, people. So, I, you know, it, it is um, clinically limiting. But aside from that sort of um, glib uh, uh, response, the regulators are comfortable with it. Great. Thanks. Um, okay, I think I've covered uh, most of what I want to in, in that. So um, this is just to show that we're opening this study in, in um, uh, how many countries? <laughs> Five countries, two in Europe, uh, Japan, the US, and Canada. Um, and uh, I can show you the sites that are currently open. And these are they. So there are, there are nine sites currently open and enrolling. Uh, and I think uh, we, uh, what's the latest tally of uh, patients? Uh, uh, eight, eight enrolled. Uh, so we have eight, eight patients enrolled so far. Uh, and uh, we expect the other sites to open up over uh, the next couple of months. All right. Well, I think I've covered what I wanted to say. I've probably been uh, uh, taken longer than I expected. But I, I hope I've shown you that the myostat in biology uh, is a, a critically important biology, and the inhibition of myostatin may have some uh, benefit in uh, shared muscular dystrophy, and that we have a drug that, if you like, is kind of third generation now. Uh, as a myostatin inhibitor uh, that we have high confidence in uh, can, uh, can uh, 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 test the hypothesis of whether inhibiting uh, myostatin in, in the shared muscular dystrophy will, will, will give benefit. I mean, um, one of the things I didn't say about the patient uh, problem is obviously this isn't genetically restricted, so uh, it's, it wouldn't be uh, a therapy either in the clinical trial or as a drug that would be uh, limited to the killer exon. If it works, it will work. We expect it to work across the board. Actually, that's a beautiful segue into a quick question. So, numerous events contribute to the pathogenesis of the shin muscular dystrophy. And, and, and so, as, as we look at the disease, maybe no one target is going to address all of the issues and is going to be fully effective in, in, in treatment. So I, I think it's important that we recognize that, that, that we have to think about targeting the, diff, the different downstream events as well. So in this case, you're targeting muscle degeneration, regeneration, and you're trying to protect the muscle by essentially building up muscle with the inhibitor, inhibitor approach. So. Um, one question I would want to ask you, but we've also gotten a question from others um, in advance, is, is how do you see this potentially contributing to part of a combination therapy approach for the shit? Well, you know, I, 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 we, we have uh, no plans. Uh, obviously, at this stage, we don't know whether it, it, it uh, works. Um, from a purely scientific standpoint, um, they're, they're, this is clearly distinct from many of the other mechanisms that are being progressed that, that address the uh, genetic uh, cause. Um, so uh, there's no real overlap there. Uh, from the safety point of view, we don't see anything now that would mean that in the future, at some point, uh, these drugs couldn't be combined. But we're not planning to do any combination studies. Um, we're you know, still at a very early stage, really. We need to, to demonstrate that this, this, uh, this mechanism can deliver benefit, uh, and, and, and we'll think about the downstream when it, uh, if we're in a fortunate position to have a drug. But in essence, you are starting to explore combination therapies with, with considering this in conjunction with, with steroids. steroids. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, that's fair enough. Uh, yeah. 
Um, and you know, I'm, I'm sure that it will uh, it may eventually be used in that way, or there may be uh, exploratory studies to look at uh, combinations. But it's it's a way off. Yeah. Just for, but as I say, there's no a priori reason that this mechanism couldn't be combined uh, with, uh, with exon skipping or some of the other mechanisms that, that may be in uh, when this gets uh, uh, is, is made available. Good. Thanks. Going back to some of the specific questions we're getting now, how about, how about that last one there, Michael? Um, any safety issues that you've encountered so far? No. Okay. Want to say anything about, about the MRI question that's up there? Uh, how long is the MRI that each boy must have done? So, um, Maybe repeat the question. Yeah, so the, the question is, how long is the MRI scan um, that each uh, boy has to undergo? So the, the cardiac MRI, I think, takes about 20 minutes. Um, and the other MRI scans are take less than an hour, is my understanding. Um, it, it depends on, on, you know, how much time is taken to uh, to to set up the equipment, but the actual scanning time is certainly less than an hour, uh, probably near 40 minutes. But um, so uh, I think an hour is what we're yeah. uh, telling people in the in the consent form. Mm -hmm. And in, ter in terms of enrollment, I mean, certainly one reason that PPMB likes to work with, with sponsors that are developing candidate therapeutics is to help get the information out to our community and inform them about their about their options for clinical trials and what, what sorts of things are ongoing. Um, and, and certainly that can help with, with recruitment. So there, there's a question of what, what you're feeling about the recruitment so far on how that's going. Well, I suppose we're, it's taken us slightly longer to get our sites uh, open and active um, than, we, than we'd hoped, you know, for all sorts of complicated reasons. Um, so there, there's some frustration there. We are learning with every protocol, with every clinical trial protocol, um, you learn as, as the uh, trial gets underway whether there are any issues that are preventing people uh, to enroll. And, and, and we are responding to what we've learned by planning some, some uh, minor, uh, mostly minor changes to the, to the protocol uh, that will help make it easier for people to get in, into the study. Um, uh, so, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, so related to that, and, and what are your expectations now about about the, the, the time, you know, the end, of, you know, finishing recruitment and the end point of your trial? Well, it's still a bit early to say. We're, 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 we're waiting to see how long it takes to get the other sites activated. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we want a, a bit, bit of a larger sample before we start saying this is going to be the recruitment rate. Yeah. You know, one thing we've noticed with, with this webinar in particular, both in advance and I see the questions coming up on the screen, is, is that obviously we, we're attracting a pretty broad audience with, with some of the questions that come in. And, and so uh, several times we've gotten the question about whether there's, there's potential efficacy for other forms of muscular dystrophy. Um, well, I, th I think the, you know we'd have to say there is potential for efficacy. Uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, the benefits that we're seeing in preclinical models certainly um, uh, there's no reason to think that they wouldn't also be seen in, in other other genetic types of muscular dystrophy. Um, and we're exploring whether it's possible with small uh, studies to to expand our experience outside of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But Duchenne muscular dystrophy is our initial focus. Once we've shown that it works uh, or not, um, then, then, but once we've shown that it works and it's safe, then we'll be uh, in a much better position to explore our communication. So we just have a couple more minutes. Maybe that look at that question about, about placebo. Right there next to the bottom. Okay. More than a third of the time. 
So, Repeat. Yeah, so, so, the, so the, the question is that our original understanding of the dosing was that no one group would receive the placebo more than a third of the time. Why did it change? Well, um, I don't think it's changed because that's been our design for a year, more or less. Um, if if uh, I mean, it, it has all, all, always been uh, that that everybody um, everybody going into the study will have at least uh, one year of, uh, of active drugs. Um, so I, I don't know where a third of the time came from. Okay. So I I think we're we're going to respect the the time of everybody on the call. Um, I think it's always good to sit down with. This is this case. It, it's been interesting sitting sitting down here in Pfizer's offices with Michael and talking with him about this. Uh, what I'd say is, on behalf of, of PPMD and our community, we we certainly appreciate your time to talk about this. And I, I think one thing that was nice about this particular webinar is, in addition to providing our community with information about this specific clinical trial, you, you've you've given everyone some insights in, into the process for drug companies and the decision making in the way you described how you chose certain endpoints and make the way the reason you made certain types of decisions. And we certainly appreciate that too. So thanks everyone for participating. Um, Really thank you, John, for, for coming and for, for hosting this webinar. We very much appreciate it. Thank Good. you. Thanks.